Yeah, so thank you, welcome back. And let's start with the QCD session, or beyond standard model. So the first speaker is Nick Evans, and he will talk about holographic tools for beyond the standard model physics. Thanks. Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you to Visberg for their hospitality, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so I put in an abstract saying that I wanted to talk about holographic tools for beyond the standard model. Um, if you go back 20 years, I used to work in beyond the standard model and I got fed up of not being able to calculate things at strong coupling. So I headed off into the formal end of the subject to find out what string theorists could tell me. And remarkably, 20 years on, I can actually now calculate things, at least in a holographic bottom-up fashion, that I couldn't calculate 20 years ago. So that's what I want to tell you about. Um, but then Johanna said, well, if you're going to talk about that, you should also overview um, the holographic understanding of QCD. So I'm going to do that for you as well. Okay, so um, there is a wide range of beyond the standard model theories out there, which go by the names of things like Technicolor and Walking Technicolor and Extended Technicolor and Tumbling. And all of these were originally motivated by theorists who just didn't like scalars. Of course, we've now found a scalar um, at, the standard, uh, at the LHC, and it looks like the standard model is doing well. Um, but what survives from all of these years of thinking is a number of models where they are strongly coupled gauge theories that behave rather differently, we think, from QCD. Um, so that's interesting just in and of itself. And furthermore, these are typically theories that you can't study on the lattice. So for example, they might have chiral fermions, although I'm not going to talk about those today. But the ones I am going to talk about are theories where the strong coupling is spread over many orders of magnitude. And that means you can't fit it on the lattice because you've got a finite number of points and you want to probe small scales, you can't have the box being too big. So although there are lattice people who are trying, I think this is still an area that is open to, you know, holog holography as being possibly the best tool out there. Okay, so... If I'm going to do this, I need to convince you that I can say something sensible about pretty much generic symmetry breaking gauge theories. Um, and of course, ADS CFT is actually formally correct for a rather restrictive set of gauge theories living close to supersymmetric gauge theories, such as n equals 4. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start top down, and I'm going to talk to you about how we understand symmetry breaking in gauge theories in a top down sense. I and mean, I'm going to try and extract from that sufficient lessons that you will allow me to move to a bottom-up formalism uh, where we can talk a much, about a much more generic set of gauge theories. All right, so, as your hand desired, we are going to start by thinking about QCD. And QCD is the archetype of a symmetry-breaking gauge theory for me. Um, it's a remarkable bit of the standard model. Classically, the Lagrangian is scale invariant. But in the quantum theory, lots of interesting stuff happens. The coupling runs, and at strong coupling, there are all sorts of interesting phenomena. OK, and the first one I want to talk about is chiral symmetry breaking. So students, remember that when you write down the kinetic term for a fermion, it splits into left and right chirality pieces. So that means that if you have massless quarks, as the up and down quark basically are in QCD, you get a flavor symmetry, SU2, mixing the up and down, but it occurs separately in the left and the right-handed sectors. Were you to write down a mass term, it would mix the left and right chiral partners, and it would break this symmetry in this fashion. But as I say, we believe that the quark masses fundamentally are basically zero relative to the strong coupling scale. That means that you should, for example, see a Z2 symmetry where you just interchange these two symmetry groups, and you should see that as a symmetry of the spectrum, which would be called parity doubling. But if you look at the Hadron spectrum, that just isn't present, and so we deduce from that that this symmetry group is broken down to the vector flavor symmetry group. So we believe that QCD, its strong dynamics essentially create a Higgs wine bottle-like potential for an operator that breaks this symmetry. And the simplest one you can write down is just Q bar left, Q right. So, you know, the, again, 
to be introductory. The um, popular science version of this is you pair create quark pairs, and then the interaction energy from QCD is so great, the energy you get back, you can pay off the uncertainty principle and keep your quarks. And so the vacuum fills up with these quark pairs. It's a sludge like the Higgs field, which means that then the quarks in a proton struggle to pass through that vacuum, and the proton acquires a mass. All right, so how do we describe this holographically? Well, let's just move to the simplest um, holographic system of quarks, which is the D3 probe D7 system. Thank you to Andreas uh, for all that years ago producing this system for us. So the basic idea is that you, the D3 brains give you N equals four super Yang Mills theory, and we know that that's dual to ADS5 cross S5. And then we introduce D7 brains to introduce flavor, there are now strings that go between the two brains. They have just one end on the D3 brains, so they're in the fundamental representation. You pick the setup so that it preserves n equals two supersymmetry, and then you know that these are supermultiplets. We work in the probe approximation where we basically ignore the quark effect on the vacuum, and then we can just write down the dirac born infeld action and ask how these things like to lie in uh, the ADS5 cross S5 space. Okay, so what happens in this theory is that the gauge dynamics has no scale associated with it, so it is incapable of creating a scale, and therefore there's no chiral symmetry breaking in this theory, as supersymmetry sort of tells you. Instead, when you, I don't know if you can read this, but this is just me writing down uh, the pullback of the metric so that I can derive, so I, I've put some magnetic fields in here, but ignore those for the moment. You end up with a very simple action, rho cubed, what square root of one plus d rho l squared, and you can just see by inspection that the way to minimize that is for d rho l. So l is the, I should say, is the separation between the d3 and the d7 brain, and rho is the direction, the renormalization group scale along the d7 brain. So you can see that that's just minimized by l equals zero, sorry, l equals a constant, and so these brains just lie as in this picture flat, there's basically no renormalization going on of the quark mass. On the other hand, it's actually pretty simple to introduce some dynamics that causes chiral symmetry breaking. All you have to do is to include a scale. And the simplest way to do that that I know of is actually just to put in a magnetic field using the gauge field on the surface of the Dirac born infeld action on the surface of the D7 brain. Um, so I've introduced a magnetic field associated with U1 baryon number or U1 quark number. It enters into the action in this way, where R is just the distance in the space, as usual from uh, the D3 brains. What this does is it says that the D7 brain does not like to go near R equals zero because the action blows up. This was first pointed out by Clifford Johnson's group uh, over in LA. The result is that you get pictures like this, where you try to, lead, to put in a D7 brain describing massless quarks, so that this D7 will come in and touch the D3, there will be some zero length strings corresponding to massless quarks. But because this D7 brain doesn't want to go into this interior around the D3 brain, it bends in this fashion, so that in the interior, in the infrared, there is a non-zero string length, and you've dynamically generated a quark mass. Incidentally, normally at this point, people start arguing about whether the magnetic field will then induce further instabilities, uh, which reflect its directional dependence. That may be the case, but this is at least a top-down demonstration of this particular instability uh, that I'm interested in. Okay, um, and I, in the early days, we were concocting all sorts of models of this type, but I came to realize that all of these are basically the same mechanism. So in all of these cases, there was some function. So I'm writing it as a dilaton. Oops. I'm writing it as a dilaton, uh, but this thing here can be thought of as an effective dilaton. So these are all theories in which there's something here. And now you want to know, is there an instability for chiral symmetry breaking? So the question is, does this thing bend away from just being flat at L equals 0 and D rho L equals 0? So you just do a Taylor expansion, and at leading order, of course, you get a correction to d rho L squared, but you just um, make a coordinate transformation to make that guy canonical, 
And then all you can be left with is the L squared term in the expansion. And, you know, if you, so L actually has dimension one in this setup. So if you write it in terms of a dimensionless field phi, just by scaling by the RG scale, you can recast this action as a canonical scalar of dimension of mass minus three living in ADS space. And then, of course, by construction, basically, a additional phi squared mass term, which comes from whatever you were doing in this e to the phi, whatever was causing the chiral symmetry breaking. So what actually happens in these models, and you know, you can think about other models of chiral symmetry breaking, like Sakai Sugimoto and so on, and basically the same sorts of things are going on. You have a, just a scalar describing the quark condensate. It starts with mass squared of minus three, so that it's describing a dimension three operator and a dimension one source, the mass and the quark condensate. But then that mass runs as a result of whatever you've done. And if it gets pushed through minus four, the BF bound in the ADS space, then there's an instability that causes the brain to go away from being flat and causes chiral symmetry breaking. All right, so here are me writing down the lessons again. All of these models just have a scalar describing Q bar Q, which you can kind of think of as living in ADS. Its mass runs, that is, it changes with uh, the radial direction in the ADS space, and the mass is related to the dimension of the operator. Okay, and, you know, I should stress that at this point, I don't really have to tell you anything very much about the geometry that I've put my probe brain into other than what this m squared of rho is. So you could imagine that I had some geometry that described some glue with some symmetry, you know, supersymmetry breaking, or it might be back reacted in some way to some other quarks than the one that I'm talking about at the moment. Who knows, perhaps you might even imagine that there could be bulk stringy effects that, if only I could describe, would enter into the DBI action in this fashion. Okay, and then the other key thing is this point that you get symmetry breaking when the mass squared is driven from minus three down to through minus four, making a BF bound violation, and you get an instability. And in terms of this formula, that's telling you that this happens when the dimension of the quark condensate starts at three in the ultraviolet, but it gets driven down to two, and at that point, there is an instability. And I should... Champion Matty and Elias's paper from 2011, which was, I think, the, the thing that really crystallized this way of thinking about, uh, well, their model, but then also these other models too. All right, and this rather ties us back in to traditional views of how QCD breaks symmetries. So in QCD, there's a running coupling, okay, and we, we often think about the coupling running, but in addition, if you look into that renormalization theory, you will realize that there is a running anomalous dimension, which is called gamma. So this is exactly the thing that is the quark condensate changing from dimension three to three minus gamma, heading down towards two. And you can, at one loop, you can calculate gamma and it's proportional to alpha, which is itself running. Okay, and if you go back to even the 1980s, there were people back then doing gap equation analysis, so schringer dice equation analysis, claiming that the point where the mass and the condensate both become dimension two is the critical point at which symmetry breaking sets in. Oh, yeah, and this thing, I, I put this in just because back in 2003, when Johanna and I were first thinking about this, we just grabbed for the first model we could find with some symmetry breaking in, which was a dilaton flow geometry due to Constable and Myers. The point here is the dilaton just isn't constant anymore in ADS, but it blows up at some scale here labeled as B. Um, so this is actually a singular geometry, so, uh, you know, this is why there was some embarrassment about using it. But what I now understand, so, you know, we did calculations back then and we compared them to QCD, which was completely ridiculous, because this is a theory that's very close to N equals four. And yet it gave quite good predictions. And we now understand why. It's because if you plot the running gamma against RG scale, log rho, 
in this theory. Um, this function here is actually, well, you have to do the expansion of all the metric factors and so on to really find out how it's running. But what you get is this blue line to be compared with the running in a large NC Yang Mills theory, which is the red line. And you can now see that what this theory was doing, it was feeding into the DBI action a running of gamma, which actually wasn't that far off the running of gamma in QCD. And that's why it then produced spectral features that were similar to QCD. All right, so that's me trying to have my top-down credentials firmly in place, because now who can resist when you've got a model where you just know that the geometry is feeding in the running of a mass squared of a scalar? Who's not tempted to then put into that some slightly different runnings and see if it still produces sense. And that's my bottom-up model called dynamic ADSQCD that I wrote down with Kimo Tubinum and Timo Allo. Um, it is, the action is just the DBI action um, of that D7 brain, except that where previously we got this delta M, so I'm writing X and L of the same thing and see how I get along. Um, to make this into a full model, you have to have a few other things that you borrow from the D3D7 system. You need an infrared boundary condition on this field X. We take the derivative vanishing uh, as that boundary condition, which is what you get for D7 brains. Um, we evaluate it, though, at uh, the point where the theory becomes on mass shell. That is where the RG scale equals the quark mass. At that point, you should integrate out the quarks, and then the running will change. We can't be bothered to do that. We're only interested in the quarks, so we just start at the point where the quarks become relevant to the physics. And the other thing is that this is all completely fine if you want to just calculate the vacuum. If you want to look at fluctuations about this, the other trick that the, the probe action teaches you is that you should, just on dimensional grounds, put in the gap size, the condensate, basically, into the metric so that fluctuations know about um, the gap. OK, so we're going to do all of that. But basically, we're just going to now take delta m squared, and we're just going to take, say, the one loop or two loop running of the gauge coupling in some theory. Let's do QCD for the moment. The cool thing about this model is that the parameters are NC, NF, and lambda that you put in through the running of alpha. On top of that, though, there's nothing other than you just choosing the quark mass as the asymptotic behavior of this field L. So it has the same parameters as QCD, and therefore it's very easy to compare. All right, so how do you behave? Well, you write down uh, an equation for this L. So that was the D7 brain embedding originally. Um, and you solve this by shooting out with your boundary conditions in the infrared, and basically whatever choice you pick for the infrared mass size runs and tells you what the UV mass is, whatever the value is out here. And the gradient of this is the subleading term, which tells you the quark condensate. On top of that, you can then calculate meson fluctuations. So for example, you can let the background fluctuate by some e to the i kx type behavior. You get the usual sort of Schrodinger type sturm leuville problem depending on the mass of the bound state. So here, we're describing Q bar Q. So this is a bound state of Q bar Q, which is the sigma meson. And you get some equation that you can solve. You find the normalizable solutions. They only exist for particular values of M. And that tells you the sigma mass and the excited, excited radial states as well. At the expense of one extra parameter, a gauge coupling in five dimensions, you can put in vector and axial fields on the surface of the brain. And those then tell you about the rho meson and a meson spectrum. So is it any good? Well, so let's look at SUNC gauge theories with three quarks. You can plot the rho mass against the pi mass. But when you're comparing different theories, you have to set the scale. So we set the scale by saying that at m pi equals 0, that's when the quark mass is 0, we fix the row mass to be 1. That sets the fundamental scale of all these theories to be the same. So all the points, all the theories are pinned here. But then you change the quark mass, and you look at what happens. And these little orange and red dots 
are the holographic predictions for SU3 through SU11. You can see nothing really depends on that. That's because these theories are basically quenched. That then gives you the excuse to go and look at the quench data from the lattice, due to barley, for example, and those are what the little boxes are for SU3, SU5, and SU7. And, okay, within the tolerances, say 15, 20% that we might hope for, for these sorts of theories, this provides quite a good match to QCD. And uh, here's a, a fit on a few more parameters by my student Will, who's in the audience, showing you again. It's not a perfect fit, of course, but it's a decent caricature of the uh, QCD spectrum. Uh, and then and normally at this point somebody starts moaning to me about the fact that the excited state mass is m squared of the excited state mass is scales as n squared. There are good arguments that in QCD where you think the quark and the antiquark are tied on the ends of a piece of string that this should go like n. And it's true um, that, it, that it gets that wrong. Uh, there is of course uh, the soft wall solution to this which is where you change the infrared dynamics and you can cook this as Son and Karch and so on taught us. In this model, what that corresponds to doing is, so this is the embedding of that D7 brain, this L function. This is what it would look like in a conformal theory. The red one is what it looks like in top-down chiral symmetry breaking theories where um, you, know, you have a magnetic field or whatever. The blue one is what I get in my model if I stop at my point where the quarks go on mass shell, which is where they hit that, you know, that line going up there. What you would have to do to get a soft wall is to continue that function below the quark mass in this rather peculiar fashion going down towards the origin. And I think it's a matter of taste as to whether you think that's acceptable or not. Personally, my suspicion is that things go like N in QCD because they are actually stringy like there quark, anti-quark on the end of a string, and that this supergravity model just doesn't capture that. On the other hand, if you're talking about the lowest excited state, the quark and the anti-quark are very much on top of each other, and then probably the supergravity is okay. So I'm just willing to live with this n squared problem uh, on these excited states, because I'm not really going to talk about them. Um, yeah. Okay, so my view on QCD is that if you plot alpha against mu, what happens is that you run to a point where chiral symmetry breaking happens. The quarks then get a mass. Below that scale, you've got pure Yang-Mills, which blows up really quickly and causes confinement. But I am only describing to the right of that line. So, in a sense, yes. Yeah, but you, you see, that's because I'm not including the physics below the quark mass, the, the dynamically generated quark mass. Uh, but that's just because I'm lazy, rather than I think because it's wrong. And incidentally, it has to be this way around, because if you hit the confinement first, the, the glue would decouple, and then you'd just be left with three massless fermions below that. So. I think that's sort of the justification for that. All right, so that's my sort of QCD uh, discussion. And now what I want to go on and say is, well, okay, let's go one step further, and let's look at inputting runnings of the anomalous dimension that are really rather different from QCD, and still hope that this model will make some sense. So where can one get some rather different runnings? Well, if you just look at the two-loop beta function for a gauge theory with, for example, particles in the fundamental representation, fermions in the fundamental representation, of course, above 11 over 2 nc, um, you, get, you lose asymptotic freedom, you've got too many quarks. But below that, at two loops, you don't just get QCD-like behavior, you actually get a running of alpha or the tough coupling lambda against mu, which comes in and hits infrared fixed points. They start off around zero, up just below this boundary, and the infrared fixed point value increases as you come down. 
So there's a belief that there is something called the conformal window, where the theories run, say, at nf just below 11 over 2 nc, they run to a weak or somewhat weakly coupled or somewhat strongly coupled fixed point, but not sufficiently strong that they break chiral symmetry. And then at some point, the infrared coupling will become, so the infrared running will become sufficiently strong that you do break chiral symmetry. And again, you can relate that to the anomalous dimension. Uh, this has got a bit messed up. Ignore that stuff with lambda. Just look at this stuff here. Um, so alpha runs. That makes the anomalous dimension run. So if the fixed point value of alpha is sufficiently large, you go through that point where gamma equals 1 and maybe trigger chiral symmetry breaking. So that, if you just believe the two-loop runnings, occurs when nf is 4nc. So for an SU3 gauge theory around nf equals 12. But above that, there should be some theories with strongly coupled infrared fixed points. The transition is quite interesting. So that's this point on this line. Because on that line, what is happening is that the running of, let's think, gamma now, is coming in slowly. And it just, in the far deepest possible infrared, touches gamma equals 1 and triggers Carl symmetry breaking. This is a situation which is known due to the work of Son, Kaplan, uh, Stefanov, and so on, to um, correspond to what is called a BKT transition, where the order parameters don't scale in a mean-free transition style, but uh, grow as an exponential of um, how close you are to the critical value of here, uh, NF. The reason that this is different is because of Efimov states, and again, Matt and Elias uh, were the ones who pointed out how those occur in these models. So uh, I've talked about the vacuum as being this embedding of that D7 brain. But um, if you actually come down to lower infrared initial conditions in your simulations, you will find additional solutions in which you cross over the axis a number of times before going out to the same endpoints out here. Those guys correspond to excited states of the vacuum where it isn't the sigma that's condensed, but the radial excited states, the sigma star, the sigma star star, and so on. They're not stable, incidentally, but they are there. Uh, and so, uh, actually, over the years, I think many people have discovered that if you plot these solutions in the condensate against mass plane, you get these spiral structures that disappear into the origin. Uh, that's true in the magnetic field-induced chiral symmetry breaking case. It is true in the simplest holographic superconductor models. It's true in these models of Elias and Matty's, and also the one that I've been telling you about. So this sort of spiral structure seems to be a a sort of a standard holographic prediction when there's symmetry breaking. Anyway, what's that got to do with the BKT transition? Well, what happens is that when you go towards that transition point, these guys' masses, which are unstable, well, sorry, the instability to roll from the flat guy to each of these guys, there's a, there's a whole bunch of unstable states, and they're all becoming lighter and lighter and lighter, and they pile up at m equals 0. That's the Efimov state. And so it isn't a mean field transition with just a single scalar involved. There's an infinite number of them, and that's what gives you this strange transition. All right, so now I want to do something, something new, which is um, that, of course, you don't actually believe those um, runnings of those theories. So I want to start to talk about Technicolor and ask the question, is Technicolor dead, or can you keep it alive? And if you try to keep it alive as beyond the standard model physics, what would it look like? So first of all, let me tell you what Technicolor is. But don't panic, because you already know it's the simplest version is just QCD with two quark flavors, except you're going to move it from living. So of course, you leave real QCD alone. You're going to make a copy, and you're going to move that copy up to the TV scale. Now there's a techni up and a techni down. And their left-handed fields are put together into an SU2 left weak doublet like all the other standard model fermions. And now when the neons in QCD, so they're the technipions here, they get eaten by the W and Z to give the masses to the gauge bosons. The thing that is, plays the role of the electroweak scale V is F pi, the pions coupling to those states. 
So you have to take f pi up to 246 GeV. And then what else is there? Well, there's just the rest of the hadron spectrum living above scales of 1 TeV. And so one might sort of think that you could go out and look for that. Okay, now this theory has been pummeled to death for years, so let me tell you some of the worst pummelings. Um, so back in the 90s, Peskin and Takeuchi pointed out that the LEP data lets you probe for these sorts of new particles beyond the standard model. In particular, if you look at, say, an electron scattering off an electron and you do it sufficiently accurately that you can spot, and it's sufficiently high energy that you can spot when there's a process where there's a W3 going along and then a loop of all possible fermions going to a hypercharge guy and then back to the electron, it's possible at LEP to measure actually the derivative with respect to energy um, of that loop. And what that does, it turns out, in perturbation theory, is just count the number of particles in that loop, including ones that are heavy. So if there were these new electroweak doublets, you would see them in here. Now, of course, it's hard to do that calculation when these things are strongly coupled, but what you can do is to say, well, look, these guys are basically going to be the vector megons, the lightest bound states of the strongly coupled theory. And if you do that, then you can work out what this S parameter, as this thing is called, is, and you can calculate it in QCD, and it comes out to be about 0.3. But the data from LEP says this thing is probably less than 0.15, probably, actually, and almost certainly less than 0.3. You're outside 2 sigma um, at this level. So that was the first way in which things were killed. But now, now we laugh at that, right? The idea that because something is twice what it ought to be, that imagining some other theory where this was different by a factor of two. People used to call that fine-tuning. <laughs> okay, so um, the point is that, you know, if you can imagine that there is some gauge theory which is different from that simple model which was a scale-up of QCD, you can imagine this would be different. And one thing you can do, for example, is that you can add in electroweak singlet quarks that change the running of the Technicolor theory take it away from the QCD-like runnings up into those sort of conformal window or near conformal window type theories. So it's not unreasonable to imagine that you could reduce this by a factor of two. In the holographic model, that's actually quite straightforward. The thing that splits the vector and axial states, MV, MA, this is the rho, this is the A meson. The thing that splits them is not this term, it's this term because only the axial guy speaks to the uh, axial symmetry breaking VEV. Um, so all you have to do in order to do this is just change this coupling kappa a little bit. So in QCD, the fit puts it at about eight. If you bring it down to one or two, then uh, it's sufficient to tune that into an acceptable parameter range. And of course, as I say here, you expect this to be NF dependent, but I've no idea how. So that, that seems a reasonable thing you can do to fix it. But that, of course, isn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem now is that we found the Higgs at 125 GeV. And if this is all true, that state um, has to be a mound state of these technicorks. Uh, so you go and you look in the QCD spectrum. Well, there is something with the right quantum numbers called the F0 at 550 MeV. But I think most people think that that is a pionic molecule. Um, the next guy up is at 980, and that's the one that the holographic models fit best to. So I suspect that this is the sigma. If you scale that up from QCD to Technicolor, the Higgs mass should be over 2 TeV. Okay, so that is a problem. Luckily, though, Crazy people have thought of a solution, and that solution are these theories which have this very slowly running strong coupling regime in the infrared, which are almost conformal theories, although they do eventually trigger the BF bound violation and chiral symmetry breaking. The argument is that that conformal symmetry tends to give you a flat Higgs potential and a, therefore a light Higgs. Our model does that. So uh, in our model, this was the equation for finding the vacuum, and then this was the equation for the sigma meson. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that the running, so the changing with RG scale with, of delta m squared is small, so that we can drop that term, 
or nearly drop that term. And then the question is, is there a massless state? So I'm going to drop this term as well. And lo and behold, the equation is just exactly the embedding equation to which you know there is a solution. So the answer is that, yes, when this delta m squared in this model becomes very, very slowly running, you do indeed get a massless sigma or Higgs-like state in the theorem. All right, so look, this is all probably crazy, but let's give Technicolor a last chance. What would it look like if this model could be made to work? Well, um, to keep S low, we have to just stick with, as I said, just this single doublet, electroweak doublet of quarks, but then you can add in extra singlets to change uh, the running of the coupling. And of course, I don't know how the coupling runs because it's non-perturbative, so I'm going to make a guess I am going to impose alpha against RG scale. Out here, I know the coupling. It's weak, and I can use the two-loop runnings for various values of NF. Let me tell you precisely in a second what all of this is. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tune this theory in the holographic model. I'm going to tune kappa to give me S equals 0.1. But most of all, I'm going to, ch at some point, I've chosen in this plot 0.7, when alpha equals 0.7, I'm going to change the infrared running by changing the effective NFIR, but I'm really just cooking what the infrared running looks like. So that it becomes sufficiently conformal that I get the Higgs mass to be half of the electroweak scale V. Right, so I don't know how well you can see this. There's a light blue curve here. That's the one you should believe. That is what QCD looks like if you scale it up. But I've just taken that theory and I've moved it to this red curve. This red curve to that point is just this one, but with me having changed lambda. But then I, I massacre this theory and give it a conformal infrared so that it gives me a light Higgs. And then I've done the same for varying numbers of flavors of techniquarks as I go up in this direction. Now look, I'm making this up, so I'm probably wrong, and probably the spectrum of all of these models is not right to describe nature. But if, by chance, nature has managed to construct this, what I would hope is that amongst these set of runnings are the sorts of theories that would exist. So then you can ask, well, can we rule them out? All right, so uh, if you go through the parameter count, you fix the electroweak scale and the Higgs mass and this S parameter, you're basically left with three parameters that we're predicting, the mass of the axial resonance, uh, a coupling, and then this parameter. But this parameter turns out to basically be close to zero in all cases, so just for today, I'm going to neglect that. This is the same parameter space that phenomenologists um, thinking about these models, such as Sasha Believ and his collaborators, have been putting constraints on with the LHC. So these states mix with the Z, so you can just produce them, well, you produce a Z, and then they, produce, they mix into these guys, um, and then you can decay them to, right, well, yeah. And then you decay them to leptons, and so there's a very clear drell yan signal. And they put on these, they put out these papers putting these enormous constraints. Look, we can exclude these sorts of theories with these bound states out to three and a half TeV. But actually, they're not yet very good. If you just take the QCD scale up, the masses of these states lie between two and three TeV, and this coupling is naturally around five, six, seven. So as has actually been known for a long time, the LHC is not capable of finding these minimal models of this electroweak scale, of, you know, of this type. Um, however, of course, this theory is completely ruled out because the Higgs mass is so low. So what do our theories give? Well, they give these curves here. Don't worry about this bit here. Just think about these guys going down here. This is for SU3, SU4, SU5, with increasing numbers of flavors. And you can see that they're predicting, our holographic model is predicting really quite heavy states. And why is that? It's because in these theories, and this is an archetype for what beyond the standard model physics is going to have to look like, there is a fine-tuned regime to get the Higgs light, which here is got by you know, pushing off 
the scale by a conformal regime. And here, if this is 1 TeV, this is talking about sort of 30 TeV or something like that. And so the strong dynamics down here is teaching these states that there's an important higher energy scale up at 30 TeV, and that tends to drag these masses up to higher scales. All right, so um, you may think it's just better to believe in a Higgs, and I don't blame you, um, but if uh, you uh, are interested in looking for physics beyond the standard model, those are the sorts of scenarios that you're starting to have to think about. I want to tell you about walking, because walking is something we can do in one slide with um, holography. So this was something that Bob Holden came up with, and it's a way of making the quark condensate much bigger than in QCD. So what we imagine is one of these theories which has an infrared conformal regime where gamma, the dimension of this operator, is actually changed from its canonical value. In our holographic model, that just means that this delta m squared is not zero. You get a solution, so that you know, this is just a constant, you can do this analytically, you get a, a solution that looks like this, which is just basically telling that m and C have had their dimensions changed a little bit from one and three. And naturally, these things have to be given in terms of the only scale this theory knows about, which is the infrared scale, where the BF bound is violated and symmetry breaking occurs. That is, it's the only scale, until you meet the scale, where these things run off the conformal infrared and go to a weakly coupled UV. Let's call that lambda one. It's sort of the one loop scale of the running. Above that, gamma is zero. I'm just putting in it as a sharp boundary here. Gamma is zero, and the solution is sort of the standard D7 brain type solution. But now you have to match, and if you just match these guys, then you find that the condensate, for example, is given by MIR to the three minus gamma, and the dimensions that make it up to three in the UV are this scale to some power. And so this is a in, in QCD, this would just go like the infrared scale, the symmetry breaking scale to the, to three, the power three. But here, you get this new scale, which you've separated from this scale in the answer. It tends to enhance that condensate. And that is all that walking ever was. And it's completely transparent in these models. Incidentally, the reason people wanted to increase the condensate was when they started to think about things like the top mass. So here's a standard model, Yukawa coupling between the top and the Higgs. When the Higgs becomes a composite of two techniquarks, you have to write down an operator which is higher dimensional to generate this, a four fermion interaction, and that's suppressed by whatever scale that's generated at, which must be somewhere out over here. So to get the top mass is hard, one way to make that easier is if you make this condensate here which eventually is somewhat the Higgs condensate. If you can make that thing bigger in the UV, which is what this is doing, then that's a good thing. All right, I've been talking about four fermion interactions. So that was the other ingredient that I didn't know how to calculate with back 20 years ago, and that you guys have cracked for us. Um, so let me first of all tell you why four fermion interactions are important, and that comes down to the Nobel Prize winning work of Nambu. He had a very simple model, before he even knew actually that quarks existed of chiral symmetry breaking, which is he just put in chiral fermions with an interaction of this four fermion nature. And he showed that this model can generate chiral symmetry breaking all by itself. All right, so the simplest way to say that is that if you just take three fermions, there's a common Weinberg effective potential. And if you plot that effective potential against the quark mass, it's this guy coming down here. It's unbounded. OK, don't panic, because normally you don't think that the quark mass is a parameter, so you wouldn't let yourself roll down this um, line. However, in the presence of this interaction, you assume that the quark mass is going to be dynamically determined, so you include this. But you also have to include this UV term. Here it is. Now I give a condensate, you know, I condense side bar left, side right, I imagine. That's what this is going to do. And that then writes down a, an effective mass term, G squared over lambda squared times the condensate. So now I've got a relationship between the mass and the condensate. I can substitute in for both of these 
condensates, and this term just gets replaced by this. So this is a term that you add in, which is a quadratic term positive in m squared, and what it does is that it alleviates this runaway and gives you uh, a minima, that is until you crank up g, make g too small, at which point this term becomes very big and you get pinned at the origin. So this is a very simple model where you have a coupling g that at weak coupling does not generate a mass, you're just pinned at m equals zero, but as you go past some critical value, uh, you do get this minimum and so chiral symmetry breaking occurs and you generate a quark mass. What this is teaching us, and again what the Beyond the Standard Model model builders have realized, is that they could use strongly coupled physics at yet a higher scale that generates these guys to have a role in electroweak symmetry breaking. So it isn't just technicolor now, there are these other possible um, gains. So can we do that in holography? Yes we can, because Witten gave us his multi-trace prescription. Okay, and what's the point? Well, so I said that in the field theory, this term in the effective potential becomes this one, but in these models I've been talking about, we have a field L that is basically just M, and so you just add in an L squared, rho squared over G squared term to your effective potential. It only lives on the surface at lambda UV. When you then vary your action, well, you get the normal Euler-Lagrange equations in the bulk, but you get a change to the variation on the surface that gives you your boundary terms. So previously one would have said that the mass was fixed and therefore delta L was zero, but now you can make this term plus this term vanish. And if you do that, it can, turns out that all you're doing is imposing this mass, mass to quark condensate, that C, relationship um, that you would have expected from just looking at this middle line here. So this is Witten's prescription for how we can include these things, and so now I can go away and I can holographically compute with these things present as well. Uh, so that gets us into thinking about what is called the holographic gauged NJL model. That's some quarks with gauge interactions and four fermion interactions, and we can Describe this too because we've got a theory that I've told you about for the gauge interactions of the quarks and now I've got a boundary term uh, condition for how I include that. Um, and what happens is pretty much what you would expect. So first of all, if you just calculate the action of the D7 brain of that, in, of that vacuum state um, against mass, it is also falling as in uh, the NJL model. And then when you add in the surface term, you get very similar behavior. So if you plot any operator against G, at low Gs, the NJL term is irrelevant, but there's still symmetry breaking by the gauge theory. But then, so this for example is for a cutoff which is 20 times uh, the strong interaction scale. As you start to approach that, you start to see that there's a transition where G is now getting up towards its critical value and at some point it takes over and completely dominates the chiral symmetry breaking scale, but there's an intermediate zone, as one expects from other arguments, um, where it's just enhancing the symmetry breaking. All right, so now I really want to tell you about the Baroque question that I couldn't answer 20 years ago that I now can. There's something called extended technicolor where you try to actually explain where these um, interactions come from, the sorts of crazy things you have to do is that you take your quarks, your top quarks, say, with its QCD interactions and your technicorks with their technicolor interactions, and you unify them, the two SU3s of QCD and technicolor, into an SU6, so here are six colors, and then you imagine, don't ask me how, you imagine that that is broken down to QCD and technicolor, and when you do that, you generate the sorts of four fermion interactions that you might want in these models. So in particular one that would feed a condensate for the technicorks down and give the top quarks a mass. So now you can imagine, well, what if these guys are strong at the same time as technicolor? So the way we do that using Witten's prescription is that we map these four fermion interactions into relationships between the top and up quark masses 
and the condensates. I'm assuming the bottom quark is massless, so the down quark uh, in, in, in the UV, the techni down is just a massless state. And now you have a theory where, where you've, you know, you've got three possible condensates and you use those to fix the electroweak scale, the top mass, and this uh, NJL coupling. So that takes a little bit of work, but Will was, was willing. Um, and this is the plot that I just couldn't calculate 20 years ago. It shows me how strong the extended technicolor interactions have to be as a function of the scale at which they are generated to give me both electroweak symmetry breaking and the top mass. So this is, um, this is the S, so, so this is the QCD scale up and then I'm increasing the number of flavors as I go down here. So I'm making the running slower as I come down. That enhances the condensate, that was walking. So I don't need as big a coupling of the four fermion interaction to give me the top mass. I didn't know how to make a plot that did that 20 years ago. And furthermore, you can see that as I increase lambda to very large scales, I'm asymptoting to a critical value of G, that's when the NJL term is taking over the top mass. And again, I didn't know how to calculate that 20 years ago, but thanks to this audience, I do. So that's good. All right, uh, I am supposed to be coming to an end. Oh, oh, I want to just talk about one other thing. Can I quickly slip it in? There's something called ideal walking, uh, which we've just done as well uh, with Will and uh, with Chasm, who's been visiting me from Iran. This is a, another idea of Soninio's. Um, now you don't put your theory just outside the conformal window so it breaks chiral symmetry. You let it actually live in the conformal window. So then it doesn't trigger chiral symmetry breaking, but you do that by putting in a new scale lambda where you have a four fermion interaction. And these theories have the benefit of the walking mechanism and of a slowly running theory that is potentially going to give you a light Higgs, and in fact, we've been studying that recently, and we've just about managed to find some theories that give you the correct Higgs mass. It should be half of the electroweak scale. So here's an example of something where we managed that. All right, uh, so I did squeeze it in, and I'm just going to conclude then. Um, so I think that holography has taught us how to compute meson spectrums of theories, and the thing that goes into that calculation it might be some horrible background geometry, but in the end, it just comes down to a running of the anomalous dimension gamma of the quark anti quark condensate. Okay, if I take you to weird and wonderful theories where the lattice can't work, it's possible that this, as we always look for, is an example of somewhere where these models are as good as it gets. It's the best theoretical tool. Um, we can do these four fermion interactions as well, and this is all you need to start tackling all of these sorts of ideas. Uh, and there's lots of fun to be had out there, so I encourage you to get involved. There you go, Martin. I'm on time. Yeah, thank you. Formal window changes what you add for Fermi operators, goes back at least to some work of Liu and collaborators in the context of condensed matter models. And in the context of VQCD, it was also discussed by Mati Gervinen. Yeah, actually, so you, you bring up an interesting point there, which is condensed matter analogues of these walking theories would be nice. So if anyone knows about those, let me know. Thank you. Uh, Nick, you use a lot the anomalous dimension, right? Now, the anomalous dimension is not an observable, right? It's at least skin dependent. So, I the confusion of understanding renormalization group running and how you map it between ADS descriptions and gauge theories, and I don't have an answer to that. I mean, you know, do you have a model with a running dilaton, what does that mean in terms of the RG running, which as you say isn't very well defined in the gauge theory, and this is another example of that. Um, guilty as charged, yeah. So, so other further questions? I don't see any further questions, then let's...
thank Nick again. Sensitivity was good, but it was too loud. It was a problem. It was a problem. Okay, then I let it stay like this. Okay. So who's the next speaker? Toby.